Welcome to One on One with Mitch LaFon. And joining me on this episode, it is former Guns N' Roses Velvet Revolver drummer Matt Sorum. We talk about his new band, Kings of Chaos. We also, of course, talk about Stephen Adler, Guns N' Roses, Joe Perry, and the Hollywood Vampires. Before checking out Matt, please check me out on Twitter at Mitch LaFon, M I T C H L A F O N, One on One, Mitch LaFon on Facebook, and paypal.me forward slash Mitch LaFon. Should you care to support the podcast, you can also find me at Instagram. Mitch underscore LaFon. And with that, here is the one, the only, drummer extraordinaire, Matt Sorum. We are speaking with drummer Matt Sorum, currently on the road with Kings of Chaos. And I, Matt, had a chance to not only see you, but meet you at Casino Rama when you were on tour this summer with uh, Hollywood Vampires. Uh, pleasure to speak to you again. Yeah, hey, Mitch. Good to see you, man. And uh, do you live up there near... You know, well, I live in Montreal, and um, you know I've been friends with guitarist Tommy uh, for for a long time. So I figured I'd make the six hour drive to to come out and see a show. But it was worth absolutely every single minute of that drive of the twelve hours there and back. It was it was worth it. No, oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Um... So, Which, uh, Joe, Joe wasn't on that gig. Tonight, <clears throat> no, Joe was on the gig. Joe uh, fell ill about uh, two days later, I think, just before Buffalo or something like that. But uh, well, in fact, let, let's just let, let's start there, and then we'll get into Kings of Chaos. But uh, how was that for you when when Joe fell ill? That must have been uh, a frightening moment, right? That was something I don't think I've ever experienced before. You know, I've had I've had a couple guys go down on stage here and there for for various reasons. <laughs> But that was uh, that was pretty scary, I got to tell you. You know, and uh, you know, typical Alice Cooper tradition: the show must go on. So, you know, we just carried on playing. You know, and I didn't stop. I didn't miss a beat. I mean, I think my initial reaction would have been, you know, maybe I should stop playing and see if he's going to be okay. And the interesting thing was, I was probably one of the only guys that could really see him fully because he'd come down behind my drum riser and. And, and pretty much was laid out behind his amp line. And, and, you know, by the time I saw what was happening and everything was transpiring, you know, there was paramedics and everyone was there. So at that point, he was in good hands, you know, and I felt like, well, you know, as a professional musician, what do I do? You know, I don't want to startle the audience to the point of it's going to put everyone in sort of a state of panic. I looked at Alice and I just saw that look in his eye and he just meant keep going, you know, and when they wheeled, Joe off stage on the gurney, you know, I could see every minute of it. And the interesting thing was for me to be able to kind of hold my place and stay where I was, you know, not confused and where I was in the song and all that. I was startled and very much in shock. But at the same time, I, I was like, I was like on this sort of like automatic pilot, if you will, like, of, well, I can't really do much if I was to stop. So let's just keep going and keep the audience sort of, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the rock and roll moment. And uh, and that's what we did. You know, I don't think in any other circumstance would I have kept going. I think it had a lot to do with Alice Cooper and being this old Bob Villian sort of rock and roller he is. Uh, a combination of things that kept me on course, kept you grounded through it. Yeah, and that, that's the one good thing about a guy like Alice Cooper. He's been in the trenches so long that. You know, he he uh, is of that work ethic that you just keep going and you pick up the pieces later. But uh, we're so glad that 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 Joe is better and that the band uh, has played shows since then. But uh, I do want to ask you more about Hollywood Vampires. But we are talking Kings of Chaos. That's why you're calling in. Um, tell me a little bit about the band. You know, you've got sort of this rotating cast of characters that comes in. At some point, do you want to make it? a band with these are the five guys or these are the six guys or do you like this sort of we'll just see who's available and we'll tour with with who's there well you know what there's a lot of ideas floating around in my head you know and like i, I you know I, obviously the vampires isn't much different of a thing that than maybe kings of chaos except for it's one band it's one singer you know but it is i mean in some people's eyes i guess you would call it a conglomeration of bands and a, a bit of a super group right but you know, Alice Cooper's done that sort of thing with me before there was a vampires. You know, I've had other things that I'd like to do. And I got to say, it's it's a real gas as a musician to play with your heroes. You know, to now say I've played in a band with Alice Cooper and Joe Perry and now, you know, with the King's Chaos, I've played with everyone from Stephen Tyler to Billy Gibbons, Robin Zander, you know, Gene Simmons has been, you know, I mean, 
the list goes on and on. And, and it's, for me, it's, it's like the ultimate bucket list, rock and roll bucket list. It's, it's, it's like, wow, I, not only are these guys my heroes, and then also my peers with people like Duffy, Steve, Steve Stevens, you know, Benton Court, Gilby, you know, Duff McKagan was on bass slash. Of course, I've been in mixed bands with those guys. But down the line, you know, I got, I got people like asking me, well, let's make a record. But what is the record? And I'm like, well, maybe I could do a record that would be a collaborative effort. And out of that record, organically becomes a band. That could happen. You know, I like to really look at my life in rock and roll as something that organically is, you know, it's like, you know, when I was in the cult, I organically ended up in Guns N' Roses. That happened by accident. You know, that was that was a, 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 an accident that happened because a couple of guys from the band were at a cult show and saw me. And next thing I knew, I got a call. GNR morphed into Velvet Revolver. You know, out of GNR morphed Neurotic Outsiders, which was a sort of super band, but, but a little bit more of a punk thing. It was Steve, Steve Jones and John Taylor and Duff McKagan. And when people say super groups, I don't really look at it as super groups. I look at it as the best of the best. You know, you want the best guys up there. Why not have a band that everybody knows the guys in the band, you know, that everybody on stage is, is a well-known commodity and, and someone that's paid their dues in rock and roll has built a name for themselves. That's okay. I, I, that's great. I mean, and the reason they built a name for themselves is they're probably the best musicians. They're, they're the best at what they do. You know, it's like, having a great baseball team or a great football team, or maybe one guy's known more than the other, but they're all pretty well-known players, if you will, to create the best of the best. So I, I, I hope that it will. We, we, you know, we've thrown around ideas and there's guys that have said, Hey, why don't we record something? And I think it's just kind of have to act, happen naturally. You know, obviously everyone's got their own bands and then there's politics with that. So Timing is of, uh, of the essence when it comes to an operation like this, you know. You know, if it does become an album down the road, do you want to get into making new music, or do you want to take some of these songs of these, you know, these great hits and put a Kings of Chaos spin on them? What would be sort of your preference? Uh, preference? Well, you know, making an album is a big undertaking, you know? And nowadays, I wonder why bands do them, you know? It's like... I love an album and I love the process of an album, but with a band like this, it would probably take two years to do, you know? I know the Vampires album, even being a cover record, took forever, you know? But they put a couple of originals on there, but I think it would probably be something more like of an EP kind of thing, like one step at a time. Like go after five songs. If I could get five songs that are my belt recorded and maybe go after a single really go like, I want to make a rock single that's going to be on the radio. How am I going to do that? And as a musician that's been in the game a long time, that was the mindset around a band like Velvet Revolver. I mean, how are we going to compete? How are we going to get out there and have a record that's going to be recognized that we can actually tour? And we were a new band. Not that we sat down and conspired to come up with a hit record. That's not the point. We just, we knew we had to create a sound that was going to be young and youthful and modern and and, and we, we achieved that by getting the right producer, getting the right guy to mix the album. Scott Weiland still had like a very big repertoire in the alternative modern rock world. So it was the right fit. So with the same sort of an idea with Kings of Chaos, what's the right fit, right? Obviously, if you got Corey Taylor on a track or Chester Bennington, those are modern rock tracks. But if you were to get a guy like Billy Gibbon, how would you bring that into the modern world? You know, it'd be like... Oh, maybe get the guys from Queens and Stone Age. You work in one of the guys from Black Keys. You got to kind of think like that. How do you bring it forward? And that's the beauty of Kings of Chaos when you come to see it. You know, some of these younger singers are coming in, like Chester and Corey. We're we're we're, we're able to sort of mix the crowd. You know, we got three generations of rock and roll there. I come a little bit later than Chester and Corey, but I come before Robin and Billy Gibbons and Stephen Tyler and these guys that came before me in the seventies, you know, so that's cool. I feel like when I'm on stage with Alice Cooper and Joe Perry and, and, and Robin and Billy, I'm the young guy, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm 10 years younger. And then I got guys 10 years younger than me, you know, which is, which is cool. That's the tradition of rock and roll that we need to nurture. We need to make sure that it survives and lives on and be, bringing in these younger guys is going to keep the tradition alive. People ask, how are we going to replace these greats that are leaving us on a rapid rate? at rapid 
at a rapid rate. How are we going to replace them? We've got to grow them. We've got to make them happen. We've got to say, well, this Corey Taylor guy's a kick-ass front man, not only with a mask, but without a mask, right? Yeah, and he and he's well versed in that old stuff. You know, I was at uh, Heavy Montreal last year or two years ago, and uh, we were watching Dawkins, and Corey was standing right next to me, and he sang every Dawkins song basically right into my ear. That was incredible <laughs> to see and to listen. So, you know, he he sort of brings that transition of all those eras. Um, but I mean, you know, if you had Robin Zander do a song. As Robin Zander is one of the greatest. Robin Zander is one of the greatest rock and roll frontmen that ever was born. Absolutely, and you know, but but like you see, have guys like Corey. Yeah. They, the problem with these young rock and rollers is, yeah, maybe they know the bands before them, but Corey has studied his craft. You know, you can't deny when you see Corey on stage that he's a, he's a great frontman, and he he's working with the attributes he's been given. You know, he's he's a stocky guy. He's a, he's a tough looking dude. But re- regardless of that, he's he's loaded with charisma, and he knows how to get an audience going. And yeah, he brings it. Oh, absolutely. That makes a great frontman. Yep. And and and, and uh, as a guy that's been in bands with some of the greatest rock and roll frontmen ever, that that's that's sort of a lost art form. So I say to any young singer, upstart singer, you know. You know, watch these greats, learn, and bring it into your own thing, and tr- continue the tradition. Because, God, we, the world needs a kick in the ass, a shot in the arm. Where is it? You know, it's like, that's what I'm waiting for. I'm, you know, I remember when Kurt Cobain came out with uh, with Nirvana. That was a shot in the arm. I mean, no, no pun intended. That's kind of a weird thing to say when you talk about Kurt Cobain, but... Uh, it, it, we all kind of went, holy shit, what is that? You know, and I remember when we all we all got like, we all got very joyful, but we all got nervous because we knew there was a new onslaught of rock and roll coming through that was going to be kicking everybody's ass. And, and that was the grunge movement. And then, you know, after that, you know, things kind of fell off a little bit. Came, you know, this punk, power punk pop movement came with bands like Green Day and some 41 and you know, we had that phase of music. Can I ask you about that? You know, you were in Guns N' Roses at that time. They were the biggest band. You were t- touring stadiums. Use Your Illusion tour went on forever and ever and ever. Were you as nervous of Nirvana as maybe a Rad or a Dokken or, or a White Lion would be? Because the band owned the world, even even with Nirvana in the picture, right? Well, yeah. I don't think we were going anywhere. You know, the thing was, it wiped out the rest of that. Sort of, that thing that was becoming very homogenized. You know, the, what happens in the music world is that, you know, you get one band that's successful and they just happen to have long hair. And they, the record companies traditionally want to continue that formula. So what do they do? They sign 50 of them, you know? And then, and then everyone gets burnt out and they want something else. It was like when punk rock came in and wiped out the 70s rock and roll. It was just like, um, they were sick of hearing it, you know, progressive music. and Punk rock did the same thing. It was a clean sweep. It was just, let's bring it to the people. And that's really what happened with Nirvana. They came back, they brought it back down to earth. You know, the thing got so glitchy and glammy and over the top with the hair metal thing. But GNR didn't fall into that category. It fell into a category of this is real music. Right. Well, it was the we GNR did. category. There was like, you know, hair metal, GNR, and then grunge, right? <laughs> you were your own category onto yourselves kind of thing. Yeah, we, uh, we, you know, we, uh, we invited Nirvana to come out on the road with us. And they basically flipped off, put the middle finger up. With it. And that was the perfect answer at the time. That was the punk rock thing to do. It was to say, you know, Guns N' Roses is corporate. Fuck you guys. We're not. We're not. We're not coming down there to bow down and kiss the ring. You know, we're, we're Nirvana. You know, and that was right, that was the right statement for them to make. And they took the world over. You know, and obviously we were made. And like, like any period of music that gets, you know, this this big uh, rap metal thing that appeared. Well, what bands remained? You know, Corn and maybe Linkin Park. But, you know, they, they must have signed a hundred of those bands, too. You know, bands that came with the best songs and were the, the originators of it. 
I'd have to say the originator of that sound would be a band that Faith No More that came way before Lincoln Park or or Corno and Biscuit or any of those kind of bands that came out of that sound. But only the good ones remained that yeah. go forward, you know? Yeah. And yeah. in those days, GNR was top of that heap. So okay. a couple of bands remained out of that, and maybe one of them was Motley Crue and the other one was Guns N' Roses. But obviously the songs stood the test of time. And uh, so, yeah, we weren't nervous about them. We were very excited about it. So we wanted to... You know, the kind of bands that we brought on the road with us at that time were Soundgarden. I remember when Nine Inch Nails came out and, and uh, these genres of music that come and go, you know, and the ones that that stay. And that that's sort of like what's happening with Kings of Chaos, which is the best of all those eras. This is the, the representative of my, my feeling of rock and roll. I mean, obviously, this lineup that I have going to the East Coast We've got almost three different decades of rock and roll on stage. You know, we've got, you know, the, the, the Robin Zanders and the Billy Gibbons, and then we come down to my generation, which is Billy Duffy, the cult. I'd say Steve Stevens came out of the 80s with Billy Idol. And then we go a little bit younger with Sun Temple Pilots came around, out just a little bit later than uh, Nirvana. And then um, Sun Temple Pilots was probably a band along with Pearl Jam and Soundgarden that were the only ones that remained really out of that grunge movement, you know, the four four top grunge bands of that era. And then uh and then even going younger with, with Chester Bennington. So probably the youngest guy on stage is Chester. Yeah, and he does yeah, a great yeah. job. I do want to ask you one thing about GNR if possible. When you joined the band and you replaced Steven Adler what were sort of the, the walking orders you were given? Was it to sort of recreate the sound, or were you given free reign to be the new drummer? Like, bring us Matt's sound and, and don't, don't copy. So what was your sort of creative input? What was the band expecting from you? Well, you know, no one, in, in those days, we never had those conversations. Everything that happened with those bands in those days was so natural, and it was everyone was given free reign, and you know, they just had this massive catalog of music that we had to prepare to take in the studio, right? So, you know, we had all these songs, and I remember rehearsing, you know, and, and, and it, everything was so much different than I expected, right? I thought I was walking into a straight-up rock band that was more like what they were doing on Appetite, which was real straightforward rock and roll music. I would say it was a crossbreed of, you know, ACDC and Aerosmith and mixed with a little bit of Sex Pistols, you know, uh, mixed with Nazareth. <laughs> and I just thought I was walking into going in to do this record, and along came pianos, these epic 10-minute opuses. And I was surprised, but, you know, I'd come from a rock and roll and progressive background. I didn't think about the other drummer at all, you know, I didn't think about it. I just kind of played what came naturally to me at the time, and we didn't have a lot of time to prepare. I think we rehearsed for about a month and we went in the studio right away. So we had to learn this 33, 34 songs, you know, and then we went in there and recorded everything thinking it was going to be one record, you know, and ended up being a double album, obviously. In retrospect, would I played differently on a lot of it? Probably, but I, I, I was so crammed with music. I had so much music to learn. You know, there's stuff on the records that I go, oh God, I wish I could have played something different there and could have done different fills or done this or done different things. But in those days, it was just so crazy, you know, about how we operated. And we take we take one or two takes and everyone would go, okay, that's great. And that meant it was in the can, you know, it was done. <laughs> that's like, you know, there's no computer. You don't cut it up. You don't fuck with it like these bands do nowadays. It was, I mean, it's, it's, it's done. You know, there's songs on those records that were one take. You know, Double Talk and Jive, uh, Don't Cry was done in a couple of takes. I would say on the average, songs were two or three takes each. You know, we would go in the studio and cut the music on a on a tape, and, you know, the vocals would be put on top, and we'd go back and do some overdubs. That's what you hear. That's the records, right? And when it came to learning the appetite stuff for the live show, I tried to be very respectful of Steven's parts and play them kind of how they were written, you know, and Obviously, we've been accused of being different drummers, but that's natural. I mean, I can't play like Steven, and Steven can't play like me, and that's that's okay. But from when I came in the band, they needed that guy that could 
kind of hold the fort together, you know, and I did that in stadiums and made sure I tried to represent the early catalog as best as I could. And uh, it was an interesting time because things were moving so fast. The band was so big. And uh, I look back at it with great admiration for that fact that we all lived through it and, and that we did it, you know, and that our fearless leader was probably, I would say, Slash because he had such, such a worth ethic. We all sort of looked to him as a band leader and, you know, Axel was really the front guy and, you know, obviously the the guy that was was, was up there, you know, really controlling the, the environment of what was going to happen that particular night. But those are the greatest times in rock and roll. You know, I got to say, when people ask me, you know, uh, well, what do you feel about what's going on now? And I said, well, you know, it's great for them, but I, I was there when it was great too. I was there when it was probably the greatest. Uh, can't ever go back in time 25 years and recreate what we did then. And I've said it before, but I always feel like it's like watching somebody else's movie. You know? <laughs> it's it's a bit of a dream sequence, you know? It's a bit of a surreal thing I lived through. And I felt it when I got the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame after you know, I just so much emotion went into getting that award. And, and, uh, and it, that's cool, you know, but it, it's just part of life and life goes on. And it, it's never going to be the way it was. That We're all older guys now. It's yep. never going to go back. Yeah, including, the, including this fan who saw you on the uh, Use Your Illusion tour. And I, of course, I saw the infamous Montreal Big, Big O or Olympic Stadium show, which... Um, <laughs> was certainly an entertaining evening for for a lot of us. Um, I, well, I do, you know, I was I was I was misinterpreted in a, in an interview that I did about what I said about the Food Fighters, and I didn't want to was not a disparaging remark against the Food Fighters whatsoever. Okay. You know, I I don't think I, I was in an interview I did with you, but it was no, no, no. Basically, I, people asked me what what's different about rock and roll, and I said, well. You know, it's different. It's not as dangerous as it was. And, and I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying it was. I was just saying I was in the most dangerous rock and roll band in the world at the time. And we never, internally, we never knew what the fuck was going to happen. <laughs> right? It right. was always on edge. There was no sense of stability whatsoever. And that kept the band in a constant state of, of sort of aggression, if you will. And when we got on stage to finally play, it was just, we either had taken it out on our instruments from sheer, you know, exhaustion or sheer uh, anger or whatever was going on by, backstage or behind the scenes, which made for that rock show that will be legendary for the, for the, for the rest of rock and roll history. Times have changed. It's, it's a corporate structure now. And that doesn't have any disparaging remark on, on the Foo Fighters because I love that band and I think they're a great rock and roll band. And in a lot of ways, there was maybe a sense of, like I said to you before, I wish I could be in a band like Metallica or the Foo Fighters or, or a band that runs that smoothly. <laughs> I didn't say they weren't dangerous. I just said that they run smoothly and I, mean, I meant that in a way that was taken out of context. So I got to right. say... I just happen to be in these situations that are always sort of, uh, uh, how, how would you say, uh, unbridled. And, and that's been a really amazing journey, but it's been one that I turn a corner and it's just another adventure, right? It's just like, and I can't say I'm living my life like that anymore, and I don't think any of us are. I mean, no. I mean, obviously, they're out there now doing it, and I'm watching it, and they're going on stage on, night, on time every night. I'm just kind of like... Well, times have changed, haven't they? And and that's Live Nation, and that's corporate, and that's a lot of things. Back, you got to remember back in the old days, there was no Live Nation. You know, we'd pull into a town, and some little promoter would put up all his money to get the band to play and hope that we showed up. <laughs> yeah, the good old days. That's how it went down. It yeah. wasn't like some corporate Live Nation guy called and said, we're going to put you out on the road for... 25 dates, and you're going to play this long, we're going to give you millions of dollars. It didn't happen like that. You know, we had independent promoters all over the country making offers, and some of them got screwed over, and some of them made lots of money, right? It's like, yeah. People have to, if they weren't there, they don't know. They don't know the old structure of rock and roll. It's, 
it was like the Wild West. It was like going out there and coming into a town and, you know, controlled chaos, if you will. And a lot, hence the name Kings of Chaos. You know, it's been a lot of my life. My life has been a pretty chaotic one, but something I could look at and go, wow, that's been really more <laughs> than I've ever asked for in, in rock and roll, you know, as far as experiences go. Right. And, yeah. and after these dates are done, will there be more uh, Kings of Chaos dates in 2017? Might we see you again up here in Canada or will you take it to South America or Japan or? Oh, I got a bunch of stuff cooking, man. I'm going to be, I'm hopefully going to be really lining it up in a major way next year. And I'm going to be doing a lot of different stuff and I'm going to try to record some music. And like I, like you said to me before, it could organically morph and, I'm just like, at this point in my life, it's all icing on the cake. I've already, you know, I've got the Rock and Roll thing. I've got my Grammy. You know, what more is there to do? Well, what more there is to do is play. And and play with no preconceived notions that I'm I'm enjoying the, the journey. And, and, you know, man, I wish you would have been in Vegas last weekend. It was just kick-ass. I mean, I looked over and went, this is the best band I've ever been in. We sounded amazing. It was just magic happening up there. So the fact that if you can feel feel that as a musician and enjoy it, that's gonna that's gonna translate to the audience, right? Yeah, it absolutely is. Now, I know we're way over our time, but I do want to ask you about one thing that you care a lot about, and it's animal rights. You know, when I saw you at the Hollywood Vampires, you had your dog backstage, and you were feeding it. I think like, you know, chicken breast or something it was. You were taking very good care of it, um, and you've also done the uh, you've joined the fight to save the dolphins in Japan and other places. Um, why is that so near and dear to you? And so what, what are some of the causes right now that, that you really are upfront about and, and supporting? Well, it's funny. I always say kids and dolphins. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do, I do music and art for kids in school. And I think it's, you know, public schools. I, I work in the public school program. I have a charity called Adopt the Art. And I do that in the L.A. area because, you know, it's accessible for me. And there's, there's a lot of kids in public school who are underprivileged just below the poverty line, and they don't have a lot of extracurricular or fun times in their life. So music, it brings joy to them. And, you know, the public school system is just struggling for money, especially in the state of California. I can't understand why when they have an 11%, 11% tax bracket, but, you know, I, I'm helping in that world. And then, I, you know, the dolphin thing came to me accidentally. I was on Twitter, and I saw, I saw a whale in distress down in Argentina, like a killer whale they'd put in a very small swimming pool. And, Right. I started tweeting about it, and all these fans did a petition to write to to get the whale released. All of a sudden, I I got online. I I called a Rick O'Berry, a guy from a thing called Dolphin Project, a very famous animal activist. He asked me to come on board, and I ended up in Japan with him and Taiji protesting the dolphin slaughter over there. And and you know, a lot of people ask me why dolphins. And I'm like, well, pick an animal. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. I mean. I consider myself an environmentalist and I'm more of a wildlife activist. I, you know, like, you, you know, people ask, am I a vegan? I'm like, no, I'm not a vegan. I, I just try to like do things that feel right for me. And I think the dolphin thing and the capture and the entertainment of animals, wild animals is sort of very out of line. Um, it needs to be, you know, shut down and sea worlds and sea worlds and, you know, I call it animal abusement not amusement, it's, it's, you know, elephant shows, uh, all that kind of stuff I'm just not into, and then the environment in general. Um, and I think it's just because it's, it's like stuff that starts to happen later in life. Different things spark your interest, and, you know, to be an activist gives me a rebellion that I like to feel, but the rebellion is about change. Right. And that's a cool thing when you can be part of something that real change is happening. And I think that with social media and a movement of people together, it's possible. I mean, look at the pipeline, what went on up there. Obviously, they got to keep fighting. But activists right. came out in the snow and fought to keep the pipeline from going through their native land. And for the time being, they won the, the, the fight. But if you don't show up, you're not going to, you know, the first thing is showing up as an activist. The first thing is getting out there and stuff you don't believe in and speaking up about it. It's like when this election happened and these kids got on the street, you know, your voice is, is, is going to be heard because you're speaking out. And, you know, 
the, the world's a crazy place, and I think uh, anybody pitching in on anything is a good thing. So that's just my little part that I do. Yeah, and it's a, and and I see it uh, pop up on your Twitter quite a bit. So it, it's something that you're obviously very passionate about, and uh, and of course you're passionate about the music. You know, the the Hollywood vampires, the Kings of Chaos, uh, your time in Guns and Roses, and of course Velvet Revolver. Um, and, and we are unfortunately celebrating, not celebrating, but uh, marking the passing of Scott. Do you have any words about Scott? I mean, he he was an exceptional front man, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I said it. I said it to Matt Pinfield when he passed away. I said, Look, I, I, you know, the, obviously the sadness of, you know, how he passed is, is obvious. But the reality is the music was on. You know, we we played that night uh, in Vegas the, the anniversary of Scott's death, December 3rd. And Robert DeLeo uh, thanked Scott for his, his music. And that's the stuff that will remain. That That's left behind for for, for eternity. You know, that's, that's going to be here. Uh, so the fact that he gave the music and we have the music is, is sort of a living part of what he left behind. And when you play the music, uh, as a guy that was connected to him musically in a band, Velvet Revolver, uh, there's a sense of him around you in spirit because, uh, the talent was undeniable. I mean, he was so talented, you know, and he had such a, a great melodic sense and a lyrical sense and he was such a star on stage, but you know, the demons were the things that not only drove him to be a great artist, in my opinion, and people ask, well, he had a lot of demons. I say, well, look at all of some of the greatest rock icons of our time, Jim Morrison, you know, these, these greats, you know, Jim, Jimi Hendrix, Albert, Janis Joplin, yeah. uh, Amy Winehouse, I, the list goes on and on, you know, Kirk Cobain. Uh, it is part of the package, you know, it, unfortunately. Um, you got this great gift of music because they had to go, go through all this immense pain and that pain brought brought genius. And um, I remember when Scott would be going through stuff, you know, and he would talk to me and I'd say, well, it sounds like a good time to write a song. And pretty much every time he was going through a hardship, he'd come back with a great song. So that pain gave us the music. And um, people need to look at it that way. They can't, they can't call him out as this person that they obviously knew he was, which was obvious. But they have to look at it as, as well, you got... You got to listen to all these great songs and his great performances. And, well, at the same time, you know, he struggled. And, you know, uh, no, it's, I've had my struggles. I've had my struggles with, 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 with it. And I've been able to kind of come out of the other side. There's certain people that don't make it. And uh, I've seen a lot of it. And you want him to make it. But all you can do is just hope. And um, I always hoped that he'd make it, but he didn't. So we just have to kind of like... Uh, be grateful for the contribution that he made to the planet. And um, I felt that the other night when I played those songs for his. And, um, and, and it makes me really uh, pay attention to people that are here, too. People that you need to acknowledge while they're still on the planet. Or, or if you've had a hardship with them, or, you know, you're going through stuff. Life's, life's short, man. You know, and you go, wow, man. It's like, wow, we're all still alive. Why don't we... Uh, why don't we figure this all out while we're here, kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I mean, life yeah. life is too short, and and uh, that's why sometimes when you look at the the grudges you had when you were in your twenties or your thirties, you go, Jesus Christ, what was I thinking? I mean, come on, was it really that important that you know whatever? And uh, it it, re- it makes you reflect, but that's something I guess we all get with age, right? As we start getting at least me, I'm heading towards fifty, and so on and so forth. You go. <laughs> But there you go. Um, Matt, always a pleasure. You know, again, I, I so enjoyed the Hollywood vampires. I haven't seen Kings of Chaos yet, but I did see Velvet Revolver. I have seen you with Guns N' Roses. Always fantastic. Just always a great, great uh, performance, and, and, and the songs that are always great. Um, thank you again. Hey, well, thank you, Mitch. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, hope to see you on the road soon, and hopefully we'll get Kings of Chaos up to Canada, because uh, we, we need more. Okay, cool. Thanks, Mitch. Thank Take you, care. sir. Have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye Take now. Care. Cheers. And there you have it, folks, my interview with Matt Sorm, formerly of Guns N' Roses and Velvet Revolver, now, of course, with Kings of Chaos. Please uh, check me out on Twitter, at Mitch Lafon, M-I-T-C-H-L-A-F-O-N, one-on-one, Mitch Lafon on Facebook. And, of course, paypal.me forward slash Mitch Lafon should you care to support the podcast. Head over to Instagram at Mitch underscore Lafon also. 
Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, bye for now. Oh, my.